All right, hello. Let's implement some stacks and queues and see the different ways that we can use the data structures that we've talked about already, array lists and linked lists, to do this. So we're going to start out with a simplified version of a stack, in particular a stack of fixed size that holds strings. And so I have on the screen here the beginning of my fixed stack of strings class. And my first step when designing a class is to decide what data is, it's is it going to have? What are its fields? How is it going to represent the kind of conceptual idea of this fixed stack of strings? I'm going to make a private string array, call it items, and then a private int n, which is going to be the size of the stack. Then all after I have my fields, next thing to tackle is the constructor, which is going to take in an initial capacity. Remember, this is a stack of fixed size. This is where we're kind of doing a limited version of the stack to start out. And I'll initialize my items array to a new string array with a number of spots equal to capacity. And then uh, implement the other stack operations that we're going to want. Some check if the stack is empty, is the number of things zero. I'll toss in an is full, since this is a stack of fixed capacity, you can actually fill up, which is going to be when the number of things in it equals the length of my array of strings that it can hold. Then we want to be able to push a string onto the stack and we're going to say, all right, the string at index, uh, we're going to push the string onto the stack by adding it at index n and then incrementing n to be the next index. And pop will do this operation in reverse where we're first going to subtract one from n, and then we're going to return the string at that index. And finally, I'll add a main method and say we're going to create a fixed stack of strings and it's going to have a capacity of five. And I'm feeling hungry, so let's push something uh, tasty onto the stack. Mmm, tasty cakes. Sounds delicious, but maybe I should be healthy, pop off cakes, and instead we'll push on salad so that our stack has some tasty salad. So that's it. Our fixed stack of strings is fully implemented. We have uh, is empty, uh, push, pop, our constructor. And so by putting these restrictions on our stack that it is fixed in size and only stores strings, we have a, a very simple implementation. Now going to the board, let's look at what this would look like visually when the main method executes. So we have, we first create our stack. and it's capacity five, so we have five spots in our array of strings, and they all have the default value to start, which for a string, as with all objects, is the value null. And we also uh, have our uh, field n, and n will have the default value for an integer, which will be zero. And n is basically keeping track of the index of our array where the next available spot to put, to put a string is. So n is both the number of things currently in the stack, currently there's nothing, and also the index of the next available spot. So let's see, see how that works. We then do push the string tasty, which if you look back at the code for push in our stack, 
it says, all right, the item at index n is assigned to the item we're, we're pushing on. So now we have tasty at index 0. And then we add 1 to n. So n is now 1 and is, again, referring to the first available spot when we then push the string cakes. We assign it to that index. We increment n, and it's now 2. When we call pop, all we did when we implemented pop was to say, all right, decrement n, subtract 1 from n, and then return the string at index n. So when we pop something, we decremented n, so now it's actually the first index that has a string uh, in our array, and then we return the string at that index from the pop method, so we return cakes. And then the last, when I pushed on salad, first thing that does is it stores the string that's being pushed on into the spotted index n. And so notice that when I did pop, we changed n, but we didn't actually change cakes at all. Cakes was still in our array. And we didn't need to change cakes because n marks the index that has the first available spot for a new string. So then when we push something new on, it's going to overwrite any old thing that was at that spot in our array with a healthier option. And as part of this last push, we again increment n. And now it's 2. And a very useful technique that I want you to take away from this uh, uh, implementation is that we have this index that is serving dual purposes. It's both keeping track of the number of things in our uh, stack and also the first available spot. And this works because we use kind of the, we fill up our internal array from index zero onward. And so we're basically using the end, uh, the end of our stack is the uh, last filled index, the, the top of our stack rather, is the last filled index of our array. And n is, and n is keeping track of that. So this was a fixed size stack. So we probably want a stack that can actually grow to be big enough for all the things that we want to push onto it. And we've seen how to do this with a resizing array. And in fact, we did this with a resizing array when we went through the implementation for ArrayList. So let's just use that. So I'm going to create a new file, call it ArrayListStack.java. And I'm just going to copy over the fixed stack of strings to start with and then modify it. So we can see how it changes as we uh, replace this representation, this implementation with our private array list. And I'm going to make this array list stack generic. And what I mean by that is it's going to be able to hold any kind of data. And to do that in angle brackets after the name of the class, I put some name that I'm going to use for the type of thing that this data structure holds. So by having this item here, that means I can say, well, my private field array list is also going to be an array list of item, and I'll call that stack. So then my constructor, which needs to match the name of the class, it's not going to take any argument, and it's going to initialize my one, uh, I'm actually going to call this items again. It's going to initialize my field items, and to do that, I'm going to need to have imported Java's ArrayList that I'm going to use here. 
I can just replace the other methods here with calls to the appropriate ArrayList method. So we're not going to need an is full anymore uh, since this, this stack is not going to fill up. Uh, but we will want a size, and that's going to return an int, and that's going to just return the result of the size method of our internal array list. And is empty is going to return the is empty method of our internal array list when we push. And in this case, we're going to push something of type item, right? Item is what I'm saying is the type of thing that this uh, generic data structure can hold. And um, when I push something, I'm going to add it to the end of my array list, right? We're going to, like with our fixed size uh, stack, we're going to use the end of our internal array list as the top of our stack. And then when we pop, we're going to return the, we're going to remove some, we're going to remove the item um, at the end of our, uh, of our array list. Pop needs to return type item. I'm going to remove the item uh, at the end of our array list uh, to pop it off the stack. And I'm also going to add another public method that also returns an item called peak, which is going to be a non destructive way of seeing what is the element on top of the stack. So pop takes the element on top of the stack, removes it, and returns that value. Peak just retrieves the item on top of the stack, but doesn't remove it. It doesn't modify the stack. It just lets you look and say, all right, well, let me peek at the top element on the stack. So all to show how we would actually use this array stack, if we wanted to write the same main method as before, copy it over from our fixed stack. Instead of our fixed stack of strings, we're going to have our array list stack. And we need to tell our array list stack what type of thing this particular stack will hold. And so I'm going to tell, all right, you're going to be an array list stack that holds strings. And then I can use push and pop exactly the same way that I was using them with the fixed stack of strings. And uh, when this is actually running the main method, this type string gets filled in for all the places that item appear, that this capital I item appears in my ArrayList stack implementation. And so that is what this sort of generic syntax is actually doing. This says, all right, I'm going to use this term, the item, as a kind of placeholder for the type of thing that a particular instance of this uh, class will, uh, will hold or interact with. And then when I actually go to create an actual object, an actual instance of this array list stack, I have to tell it an actual type that it's going to hold, and then that gets filled in for all of these. So you can see that in the in the thing that pops up when I mouse over these these methods, the the type that is shown that pop returns or that push takes is type string because for this particular stack, string is the type of thing that it's holding. All right, so let's again, try and visualize what this is going to look like when it runs. And instead of this main method, I'm going to do something a little more complicated. We're going to have this text file, 2b.txt, uh, which has uh, a few words, to be or not to, and then also some dashes. So I've copy-pasted this main method from the notes. Uh, I'm not going to go through it line by line, because uh, the, the details are not really that important. But what this actually does is uh, reads in the file and it's going to push each word onto the stack 
every dash pops a word off of the stack. So if we look at a picture of what this looks like, this is what we see. So the things that are being uh, pushed uh, are along the top here, and then whenever there's a dash, something is getting popped off. And what this is showing you is the internal content, contents of the array lists uh, array after each operation. So this is assuming that our uh, array list implementation had, uh, we're using Java's array list, which the documentation says has uh, a default initial uh, capacity of 10. So its internal array will have uh, 10 spots, indexes 0 through 9. And uh, this arrow here is showing you, uh, like with the fixed size stack, showing you kind of keeping track of what both the number of things uh, that's in the array and the first available first available spot, which is indeed how our uh, array list implementation worked as well. And so we can see that each time we push something on, we're moving this, this index, this arrow uh, down, which this arrow is, is just an integer, it's just the index. So it's one when it refers to index one, two for index two, and so on. And then when we get to a dash, we pop something off, we uh, uh, return it, and this, uh, this n, this index, is moved, uh, is, is moved up, in this case, to a, to a lower index uh, to make kind of that be the next available spot. And you can see that when we pop 2 off and then push b on, we overwrite 2 with b. But when values get popped off, uh, in this array-based implementation, we don't overwrite them. We can just leave them on the array because overwriting them would be extra work that we don't need to do because once they've been popped off, once our index kind of moves uh, past them and they're no longer considered to be kind of part, uh, uh, to be within the part of the array that has actual values, um, they can, uh, there's, there's no need to, to reset them to the default value or to null or, or anything like that because when we use that space again, we'll overwrite it with the thing that's being pushed on. Like when we uh, pop off B and not, those are, still, those are still there, but then when we push that onto the stack, it overwrites not. We can leave them there because we're going to overwrite them when we use that space. And if we don't use that space, then we never care what's there, whether it's the default value or something else. Uh, and the last part of this picture is just you can note that uh, as we have seen with array-based implementations before, uh, there's going to be there can be some space wasted uh, when we're not near the capacity of our array. So one important property of a stack is that we're only interacting with one end of the structure, right? We're pushing onto the top and popping off the and this makes a linked list an excellent candidate for the kind of internal data structure for our stack because it is very efficient at providing constant time. It can provide constant time operations at the head of the list. And we don't have to worry about wasted capacity or resizing the way that we do when uh, using an array-based implementation. So I'm going to create a linked list stack.java. So like before, I'm going to copy my previous uh, implementation for my ArrayList stack and then modify it to use uh, a linked list. So this again is going to be a generic structure uh, holding things of type item, but my items are going to be stored in a uh, linked list instead of an ArrayList. I'll need to import Java's linked list change my constructor to match the name of my class and have it construct a linked list instead of an array list. And the other change I'll make is to change my add and remove calls uh, to specifically use the front of our list. So instead of add, I'll use add first. Instead of remove with an index, I'll call remove first. And I'll also call get first instead of get. 
So now I've adjusted my push, pop, and peak operations to all interact with the head of my internal linked list. And that is the extent of the changes that I need to make. I'm still using this linked list uh, data structure. I'm relying on calls to methods implemented by that data structure to provide the implementation for my stack methods. Last, I need to change my main method to use a linked list stack instead of an array list stack. There we go. And we're all set. So we're again going to look at this visually zoom out on this, and we're still processing this file with a fragment of a line from Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is, and with some dashes in here so that we're pushing and popping, and we can look at what does our list look like as we push and pop. So each time we push something, it's pushed on to the beginning of our list. So after we've pushed these first five words, the first word that we pushed is at the end, to be or not to. And these, and then when we pop, we pop from the beginning. So we remove our uh, initial node, and uh, then the node after that becomes the new head of the list, like we have seen in previous topics. And uh, as you can tell by looking at this image, there is not uh, any kind of unused capacity uh, when we when we implement a stack uh, with a linked list. Now this picture uh, makes it look like these are singly linked lists, but our code used Java's linked list object, which is in fact a doubly linked list. If we wanted our uh, list to for the stack to be a singly linked list, which we might because the singly linked list uh, provides constant time operations at the head, which is all that we need, and would use slightly less space than our doubly linked list because it doesn't have any of the previous uh, references with each node like our doubly linked list does. So if we wanted one with a singly linked list, we would have to implement it ourselves, something like singly uh, linked stack.java. And for this, uh, I won't go through the whole class, uh, but there are a few things that uh, I want to highlight. One, we're going to have a private uh, list node that say the, uh, uh, maybe we'll call this the top since it's, the, it's going to be the top of our stack. And then when we, uh, we'll have a constructor, uh, we'll have, um, We'll have a, a private in n for the number of uh, items in our stack. And I mostly wanted to uh, highlight uh, how we would implement uh, the push and pop uh, methods, kind of these, these key stack operations. And you can refer to the notes for the full code for this class. So we're going to push uh, an item onto our stack, which needs to be not that way, but needs to be uh, generic. Um, and when we push something onto the stack, we'll uh, save the old top, uh, we'll save the current top of our stack uh, in uh, a local variable, and then we'll set uh, the top to be a new list node and then uh, we'll set the tops item and uh, we'll set that it's next is the old top and we'll also increment our size by one so when we push something onto the uh, the front of our list we're doing this familiar singly linked list operation of creating a new node and setting its next to refer to the old front of the list and pop is going to do that in reverse. We're going to check to see if our uh, stack is empty because if it's empty, pop is not a legal operation. And in this case, we're going to throw an exception, the no such uh, 
element exception. And this is uh, typically how kind of when a method is called and it's called under conditions that do not that make that method invalid. So our stack is empty. Someone has called pop. You can't pop from an empty stack. The typical way that uh, this is handled is to throw an exception and a, a, a type of exception uh, that is kind of appropriate to the kind of error that has occurred. So you call pop on a stack, throwing a no such element exception makes sense. Uh, this no new no such element exception, this is just constructing this exception object. This no such element exception parentheses is a constructor. We have the keyword new to construct a new object. And then there's this keyword in Java throw, which is how you cause an exception to occur. Uh, there is a, a Python also operates uh, on the basis of exceptions. Instead of throw, the keyword in Python is raise. You raise exceptions in Python. You throw them in, in Java, but the, it is the same, the same principle. It is how you kind of communicate errors to the system. And in a future topic, we'll see how to actually uh, write code that anticipates and handles these exceptions. But for now, we're just going to, to see that in, in a data structure, when we try and remove uh, an element that doesn't exist, we typically throw a no such element exception. But on to assuming that now our stack is, is not empty, I should say that throwing an exception uh, ends the method call, like a, like a return would. Um, and so nothing is going to happen in that method after we throw the exception. So the code after this if will only be executed in the case where the stack isn't empty, which is good because what I'm going to do is to save the tops uh, item in a local variable and then remove the current uh, uh, top from the stack by saying top equals top.next, right? We're just um, having our, our field top refer to the next node in the list subtract one from our count of elements, and finally return uh, the value that was on top of the stack. So this is how we do push and pop. Again, refer to the notes for a full implementation. All right, so let's move on to queues. And queue, the, the abstract data type of a queue provides operations that, that add to the end of the queue and remove from the beginning. So we get this first in, first out behavior. Uh, and this again makes a singly linked list with a tail reference, an ideal data structure for implementation because a singly linked list with a tail reference is uh, one that provides constant time adding to the end and removing from the beginning, which is exactly what our queue will be doing. So if I have my uh, singly linked uh, queue.java, this is going to be uh, very similar to my singly, oops, singly link stack. But in addition to a front of the queue, we're also going to need a no, uh, to keep track of the end of our queue. And again, I'll just uh, highlight kind of the essential operations. Instead of push, we're going to have, we're going to add an item. Instead of pop, we're going to remove an item uh, from the front. And for add, what we would do to add to the end of the, of the queue is to say our end.next is a new node. And then end equals end.next and then our end item equals item. So we have our end, we create a new node, we say end.next points to this node, then we take our end uh, field and we move it to end.next, this new node, and then we set the item uh, in that node, add one uh, to the count of elements in our queue, and we're done, except for the case that this implementation of add is going to cause an exception. It's going to run into an error in a particular case. 
So you might pause the video and take a moment and see if you can identify what is the special case, what is this edge case or boundary case that isn't currently handled in this ad that would cause a problem. All right, you may have noticed that if our queue is empty, end is going to be null. There's not going to be a node at the end if the queue is empty, end will be null. And if we do null.anything, we get what's called a null pointer exception, and this operation would fail. So we need to handle this is empty case separately because we have to do something particular uh, when the list is empty. And for this, when the list is empty and we're adding to the end, that's the same as adding to the beginning because when we add one node to our linked list, the front and the end are the same, are the same node. There's just one node there. So for this, I'm going to say front equals uh, our new oh, list node rather than node. That's and then I'm going to say that uh, the item at that node is item. And then I'm just going to say end equals front because end and front need to point to the same node uh, when we're adding to, the, to an empty list. And now our add method is complete. Let's move on to remove. Remove, we're going to do the same uh, checking if it's empty. If you're removing from an empty queue, well, you can't do that. And we're going to throw a no such uh, element exception. But assuming it's not empty, we just remove from the front of the list. Uh, when the, uh, we're going to save the item that's at the front, we're going to update the front to be the next node in our list, subtract from our count, and then return item. All right, so that's add and remove for our singly linked list-based queue. You may be wondering, can we, we did a stack with both an array, array list, and a linked list. Could we do the same with the queue? Well, the key reason that we haven't is that a queue has two ends that, be, that get modified, right? We're adding to the end and removing from the beginning, whereas a stack has only one end. We're pushing and popping from the, from the same end of the stack. And as we've seen, an array list can efficiently add and remove from the end of the array, but not from the beginning. So that makes it appropriate for the stack, a data, uh, an abstract data type that is dealing with just one end, but not for our queue. And this is the reason why Java's linked list class implements the queue interface, but ArrayList does not. Uh, ArrayList is not a queue. However, we do have a solution to this problem. Uh, and like with, we're going to use this, a similar strategy to the one that we used with our fixed uh, stack of, of strings where we have an integer that's keeping track of uh, the first available spot in our, in our queue. And we're going to modify this by adding a second integer that is going to keep track of the beginning of our queue. And this is similar to how we have a head and a tail reference for our linked lists. We're going to have two indexes that kind of serve a similar purpose. And so let's see how this would work. How are we going to make a queue using an array? So we're going to start out with We have a queue of integers, and we currently have three things in it. We have three, seven, five. And we have our two integers that are keeping track of the front and the end of our queue. And so we have the front of our queue, which has the value zero. We have the front of our queue, which has the value 0. And we have the end of our queue, which has the value 3, because these are just the indexes of 
where the front of the queue is and where the end of the queue is. And these spaces aren't blank. Uh, they have the, we haven't put anything in them, so they have the default uh, integer value of zero. All right, so what happens if we remove from this queue? Uh, let's give it a name, queue, and we say queue dot remove. So when we remove, we're just going to adjust, right? We're removing from the front of our queue. We're just going to adjust our front index to say, all right, the front is now in a different place. So we're going to add one to front, and it's going to say, all right, the front of the queue is now here. So the queue now has two elements, seven and five. Three is no longer part of it. Like before, we don't actually need to overwrite three with anything. It's a spot in the array that's not part uh, of the current queue, and so we don't care uh, what, what is stored there. So if we say add two, first step's going to be put that in the spot currently marked by end, because end is saying is telling us the first available spot in our queue. So we make this two, and then we move end over one. And what if I added something else to the queue? And you may be thinking, well, Aaron, he's in quite a jam now, and there's nowhere for it to go, right? How do we add one to end? It's now five, that's not a valid index. Uh, in the array, and you'd be absolutely right, and there is kind of one final ingredient to making this work, which is that when our, uh, either one of, of our markers here go past, would go past the end of our array, we're going to wrap them back around to the beginning. So when we add eight, we're going to update the spot in our array, and then we're going to add one to end, see that it's past the end of the array and move it back around to the beginning. And the elements currently in our queue are going to be everything that's between our front and our end, including wrapping around. So we're almost, tr we're, we're basically treating the last spot in our array and the first spot as if they were connected, as if this thing uh, was uh, forming a, a, a circle uh, as an array. And if we added, uh, if we added another, then we'd end up with end and front at the same place, which, uh, uh, which is going to be true whenever our array uh, fills up. If we kept removing, we'd update front uh, all the way around. Uh, until it was also uh, on, on top of end. Uh, so using these kind of two indexes is how we can uh, implement a queue uh, via an array. And uh, linked from the notes is a kind of complete implementation of this kind of array-based queue, which also includes code to resize the array uh, like, like we would do with an array list. All right, the last, uh, the last kind of uh, structure I want to talk about is an abstract data type called the double-ended queue, which is often shortened to being called the, uh, a deck. Uh, pronounced like uh, like deck, and a double-ended queue is simply a queue that can where you can add and remove from either end of the queue, uh, and so in the sort of real-world analog where a queue is sort of like a line at the grocery store and you get in the end and you leave from the beginning, kind of the double-ended queue that metaphor breaks down. Um, hard to think of. Uh, a lot of lines where you can get in and leave from either end. That, that would be pretty confusing uh, in, in real life. But a double-ended queue does turn out to be a useful uh, thing in computer science. And 
Uh, it provides a set of operations which may look familiar to you. Uh, we can add at the beginning, we can add at the end, and we can remove at the beginning and remove at the end. And uh, if this uh, if these operations are uh, look familiar, it may be because uh, our linked list implementation had these same methods, and that is not an accident since the linked list data uh, class in Java implements the DEC interface. So like Q, DEC is an interface that defines a set of operations which uh, the linked list class uh, provides. Java also provides an, an array-based uh, version of a, of a deck called an array deck, uh, which resizes the array and uh, likely uses a, a kind of two-index uh, strategy for managing the start and end of that uh, of the queue within the array, uh, like uh, we just talked about. All right, so we're seeing how the different structures that we've talked about are kind of building on each other and composing where we have these abstract data types, uh, stack, queue, deck, and they can be implemented uh, either using an array-based uh, approach like our array list. They can be implemented using a linked list. Uh, I should say our double-ended queue is where uh, a doubly linked list comes in handy because we want to add and remove uh, from the end. Uh, add, add, and, add and remove from the end and from the beginning. And this is a core idea from this course where these ideas kind of build on each other and interact in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, with that, uh, I look forward to seeing you in the learning block uh, and seeing your questions.